But nonetheless, we're going to go through Psalms 145 through 147 here. Um, this is a collection of Psalms, one from David and two from a, an unknown author. And really, in Psalm 145 here, this is going to be the last recorded Psalm of David. So I feel a special honor to get to go through the last Psalm that has his name attached to it. There's a lot of interesting things we're going to glean from this. We've got kind of a lot of, of uh, text to get through, so we're not going to read absolutely everything like we have on some of the other songs, but we'll do our best to kind of pick and choose areas to dive deeper on um, where it makes sense. We, we will go ahead, though, and just start off like usual, and we'll read the first um, first five verses of these. Um, Grant, would you read the first five verses? I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous words, I will meditate. Thank you. So one of the things that I love about how David talks about this psalm is he gives a special mention to God and calls him O King. And I think it shows David's reverence here, particularly given his significance as being the king of Israel. You think about him and the, the power that he held, the kind of influence that he held. He starts off this psalm by recognizing that God is the king of kings, David's king, the one true king, um, and really starts off this with a proper proper frame of reference um, for who God is. Uh, one other thing that's very interesting about this is he also mentions, you know, a generational aspect. I can't help but thinking, you know, by putting myself in David's shoes, we don't know the exact time frame this was written in, but given that it's, you know, towards the end of Psalms, I think that this is likely towards the end of David's life. One thing that he's probably very much focused on is, you know, passing on the lessons and the things that he's learned from his uh, lifetime to other generations. And in verse 4 here, he says, one generation shall praise your works to another. You know, I think that's definitely something that's on David's mind as he's writing this. Um, any other thoughts about maybe what might be on David's mind as we start to get into this psalm uh, when, he's, when he's reflecting on these passages? Any other thoughts from the first five verses here? We'll keep moving. Let's go ahead and read verses 6 through 10 here real quickly. I'll read those. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts, and I will tell of your greatness. They shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness, and shall shout joyfully of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful slow to anger and great and loving kindness. The Lord is good to all, and his mercies are over all of his works. David transitions here to start to talk about how uh, to remember the power and the greatness of God. And he also starts to highlight how men will hopefully remember uh, God and his good deeds. You know, in verse 7 he says, They shall utter the memory of your abundant goodness, and they will shout joyfully at your righteousness. And then he mentions something that we see in parallel to the New Testament, right? There's a very common passage where it talks about here, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and great in loving kindness. And then the Lord is good to all. His mercies are over all his works. Why do you think David starts to mention some of those things, particularly in verses 8 and 9, around slow to anger and great in loving kindness, at this stage of his life, potentially, and where we're at in this psalm? Any thoughts, ideas? I think it's a reference. 
he's quoting an, uh, Exodus 34, 6 and 7 when um, he talks about um, he's merciful, slow to anger, and great in loving kindness. Back in Exodus when he was, God was talking to his, uh, Moses about his attributes, yeah. that's what he kind of goes into, which I've recently found that Exodus 34, 6 and 7 is the most quoted verse. It's like our, back in the day, it was like the John 3, 16 yeah. kind of thing. So that's kind of interesting to tie that in, that God's attributes, how he described himself to Moses. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that what's interesting in this is it plays off of what we were talking about in verse 4. You know, I think David's really taking a reflection at this time, particularly in this psalm, about all the works of God, all the greatness of God, his majesty, his splendor. The topic for this class and these collection of psalms is God's greatness. And I think you're exactly right when he's referencing that verse. You know, that's a very common verse. It's a passage that many people would know. And he's wanting to instill this into whether or not that's the next generation, but it's, it's something he's including in this psalm of praise. Moving on, let's go ahead and, and skip down now to verses 14 through 20. So we're going to see now David start to transition to um, really a culmination of this entire psalm talking about God's praise. And he's going to highlight a couple of interesting things throughout this. Um, we'll go ahead and just read, read, read real quickly these, these six or so verses. The Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. What do you think David's highlighting here, particularly in these last four or five verses? Why talk about those who love him, those who fear him, those who call upon him in truth? Why did David mention those things, do you think? reflection given the, the time in David's life that this is likely being written I think that he's focusing on what's the most, most important thing what does the what what was uh, Ecclesiastes when, when it's all said and done what does the, the writer there say is the most important thing somebody absolutely and I think he's highlighting here something similar right those who love him, those who fear him, those who call upon him in truth, that is what's most important. And David's wanting to highlight this at this stage in his life, and he's not wanting to let others lose sight of that or focus on something that isn't you know, ultimately important um, in their life. We also see here that David really recognizes just how much man relies on God. You know, particularly uh, in verses... Um, verses 14 and 15, we see the Lord sustains all who fall, all the eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due time. David notices how God takes care of his own people, I think, and at this stage of his life, reflecting and thinking about you know, the times when God has helped and provided for him, he's been in some of the most difficult, precarious situations when you think about um, the things that he's gone through. And I think he's definitely wanting to highlight that here in recognizing all that God has blessed him with, all that God has seen him through uh, in various aspects of his life. Any other thoughts or comments on those particular verses? Before we go towards the end of Psalm 145? I know we're covering everything really fast as opposed to how we have been, but... Okay, we're going to move to the last two verses here. Well, he 
says in uh, verse 20, The Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. One of the interesting things that I think David leaves here particularly with is his passion and love for God and, and his abstain or his, his dissatisfaction for people that reject God. This is something that we've seen him mention time and time again in his psalms. And really when I think about why he you know, has this opinion, it, his rejection of the wicked doesn't come from pride. It comes from his love of God. And I think this is probably one of the best ways that he could have ended a, a psalm other than recognizing his love for God as he does in this, in this particular psalm. Any other thoughts or comments on Psalms 145? Yeah. Um, you know, it seems like as we've gone through the psalms, which I think has been such a neat process to kind of go through, um, you know, several of the psalms we looked at, we, you just get such a variety of, of who David is and what he's going through in, that mo in the moments and some of the despair he went through and some of the questioning of God that he went through. Um, but... David is a man after God's own heart, and so when you read psalms like these, it, I think it really helps you understand the complexity of who he was, but this is the root of all of it. You know, he could question and be a man after God's own heart because he really did believe these things. Um, and this, you know, I, I just think it's beautiful to get to see all of it because life is complicated, um, but the despair, going through those times of despair, but knowing that this is at the root of it, uh, to me, is just like this perfect balance and a beautiful thing for us to see who David is and the depth of his soul. Yeah, absolutely. I think he's putting that on full display here. And, you know, David's recognizing all those different times that he's gone through, both the good and the bad, and I think finding the beauty in it. I think it's just the humility that he had to, that it, being so humble allowed him to come to God and truly serve him and honor him. And, and dearly loved him. I mean, he had so many resources. He could have been so arrogant, um, and he, he didn't. And it just, I think it showcases what it, a humble and loving heart he really had. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you think that there's a reason that he emphasized um, let all flesh instead of maybe leaving it at like let all, meaning with spirit, with everything else, but instead he emphasized flesh? Do you think there's a reason? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I think oftentimes we see mention to flesh when we're referencing all of creation, right? Not just man, but, you know, man, beast, bird, anything that lives, that walks on the earth. You know, there's multiple um, examples throughout Psalms where it talks about how all creation and all flesh, you know, glorifies him and all that he does. And that's, that's my thought, you know, when I first read this, I thought all flesh will bless his, his holy name, um, is that it's just a reference to everything. Um, that lives, any any living thing. Um, if anyone else wants to comment, you know, feel free to do so. But that's that's my initial thought. Too. Any other thoughts on Psalms 145 before we move over to 146? Yeah. I think it's kind of interesting. Like, if you look back at some of David's earlier songs, a lot of them are about God's like power and might, and he's going to, you know, get rid of the evil one, and he's going to uphold the righteous one. But in this one, he doesn't really talk about God's might as much as God's heart. It's like his love and his gentleness. And he doesn't really say the Lord is near to the righteous or anything like that. He says it's those who call on him, who fear him, who love him. So I think it's kind of interesting. He's gotten to know more about God's inner person as he's gotten older. Yeah, that's a great observation. You know, David always focusing on the heart, someone that was after God's own heart. I think that's definitely evident in this particular psalm and, and something good to pick up on. All right, let's, let's uh, keep moving here and go ahead and look at Psalms 146. So we transition now to a, a, an unknown author, a much shorter psalm, but one that focuses on um, a couple of different things, uh, namely where to put our trust, uh, what the Lord has, has done to you know, provide and protect those that he, that he loves, uh, but again, it's a it's a psalm that's focused on praise and focused on what the Lord has done um, done for this psalmist. 
We see here in verse 3, he says to do not trust in princes, in mortal man, in whom there is no salvation. A very interesting way to start this psalm. Uh, the psalmist, no doubt, is probably thinking, you know, in his praise, who do I trust? Who do I look to? Some of the very things that David asked uh, throughout his, his life and through some of his psalms that we saw. Why do you think, though, that we will always be disappointed if we put our faith in, in man? As the psalmist states here, what what are some some ideas? I mean, just constantly we fail, we let people down, we sin. So, you know, it's it's hard to when you have a God that's you know will always love us, always be there for us, and won't yeah. fail us. Um, that's but yet we constantly keep going back to a man that's even though we, we know we shouldn't be putting all of our trust in there, and yet we constantly do that. Yeah, that's definitely one thing. Why, why else? Why else is it so easy for us to trust our fellow man? I think because we can physically see them. And like, we, we just know that they're there. And with God, like, He does things for us, but it's not like we can just you know, have a conversation and just see it. So we put our trust in what we can see, but that's not always where we need to be putting it. Yeah, absolutely. We're visual creatures, right? At the end of the day, we're designed with eyes. That's one of our weaknesses, right? And, and connection. And no doubt, it's something that ultimately, I think, can lead us astray. Well, I think one of the biggest things to, to zero in on is what the psalmist mentions at the end um, of verse 3. He says, in whom there is no salvation. So while it's definitely true we have a tendency to trust those that we can see or you know, put our faith in somebody that may be infallible or, or um, somebody that is imperfect, ultimately they don't offer us salvation, right? Whether it's the President of the United States, our local officials, a CEO or somebody else on this earth, they they are not the person that gives us salvation and that will always lead to disappointment, right, at the end of the day. And I think that's one of the, the biggest things to draw out of maybe these first couple of verses and something that the psalmist is wanting to depart, you know, or impart wisdom on us. There's a lot of similarities that come to find between the psalms and, you know, Proverbs where we find just traditional wisdom invoked and this is one of those verses that I think about when we see a lot of contrasting and comparisons between the, the wicked and the righteous. This is something that definitely fits um, within that. Let's, let's shift ahead now to verses 5 through 9, and we'll go ahead and, and read these. They're fairly, fairly short verses. Um, Chad, would you mind reading these for us? Blessed is he who, whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches the sojourners. He, he upholds the widow and, and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. So we see a shift in, in tone now from, you know, a very fatalistic, you know, do not trust in man to now trusting on it, or focusing on some of the positive things that the Lord has done, that the Lord provides us. Um, he, he gives us a lot of reasons to remind ourselves of why to trust him. And I think that's important in how he shifts his tone from where he started in verse, in verse 3. What, what, are, what are some of those reasons that we just read? What does God offer us? Why, why should we trust him? He's creator of all. Yeah. Class over, right? Yeah. He's, He's, faithful. Hmm? He's faithful. He's faithful. He's creator of all. He's been working a long time. The fact that he calls him the God of Jacob, even... As David was writing this, this would have been uh, a lot of time has passed, and so certainly for us as well, it it just speaks to 
not just his faithfulness, but his unfailing faithfulness through the eons. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He mentions several things here. You know, God offers justice. He offers food to the hungry. He raises the fallen. Is there any parallels you can think of, particularly to the New Testament, with examples that we see from Jesus? Anything? Ring a bell? All of them. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm worried, man, we didn't read the New Testament. But that's okay. Yes, absolutely. All of them, right? How many times have we seen, uh, you know, Jesus, you know, caring for widows or providing food, you know, through different miracles. Uh, absolutely. I think these are all powerful examples, you know, that the psalmist is giving us for reasons to trust God. And then, you know, we see these things carried out in Jesus' very life. And this isn't a messianic psalm, per se, but how many times do we see those, those psalms that point to Christ? And I think this one is just another great example um, of that. One of the other things I want to draw out from these few verses here is that, you know, when we demonstrate our faith in him, that is praise, you know, to him. And I think that the psalmist here, whoever, whoever this author is, uh, definitely understands that. And he gives us reasons to, you know, increase our faith in him. He gives us reasons to understand why to trust him. And ultimately, those are things that we can use, you know, in our prayers uh, to offer up praise, you know, to God. And I think that that's such a great example to us today. I know there's so many ideas throughout the Psalms that have helped me in my personal prayer life. Um, and I think this is, this is one as well. Any, any other lessons from maybe these first, uh, this particular Psalm that you have taken to apply to your life, whether in prayer or in your faith, uh, et cetera? Anything else stick out? And in this one, verse 8, about um, upholding all that have bowed down or have fallen. And so two people say the same thing, two different people. I mean, not a coincidence. And of course we know that. But it just brings more true that two different authors speak to the same fact. Yeah, absolutely. I think you find a lot of the same themes throughout David, Asaph, and whoever these unknown authors are throughout here. You, you've probably found me doing this throughout our classes, too. Sometimes I'll just incorrectly say David, you know, when I think that a psalm is, has David's name on it. And I think that so many of them, you unless you look up to see who the author of this is, it's unknown a lot of times. And you can interchange David or Asaph or any of these other writers for that. And they, def they definitely, you're right, they definitely have very, very connecting themes, I think, um, which corroborate each other uh, for sure. Anything else in Psalms 146 before we move to Psalms 147? All right. Let's go ahead and move to Psalms 147. Psalms 147 is really a, a psalm of praise for God's creation, all of the things that he's given us, and strength for all the things that he provides us. We see this psalm start out with more praise, praise for the Lord, for his good to sing praises to him. And then he talks about how the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. And then he, he hints in on another very similar theme that we've just talked about, and what he can do, what he provides, how he heals the brokenhearted, he binds up their wounds. Um, and he details, you know, very well some of the same things that David talked about in Psalms 145, and um, the unknown psalmist in, in 146 talks about here. He then demonstrates his care for his creation and all the things that he provides, um, particularly in verses 5 through 6. Let's go ahead and read verse 5 through 6 and zero in here. Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. The Lord supports the afflicted. He brings down the wicked of the ground. Thinking about what we talked about in a couple classes ago around understanding, particularly within our suffering and our afflictions and how often we isolate ourselves, why is this so important to understand? Why is verse 5 so, so critical to us 
in our walk with him. Um, in verse 5, another word that you can put in for great is sufficient. And he's the, in God's the only person that has sufficient power um, to fulfill um, this and have an understanding like that. Um, and so I think that that holds um, a great amount of um, importance, I guess, on why we should follow him and trust him and um, put everything in him because he's the only one that is sufficient enough to have an infinite understanding like this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Nobody understands me completely, even my husband. Um, but God does, and he knows everything about me. And so his compassion can be boundless <coughs> with everyone because he understands you fully. Yeah, absolutely. But what's the shame of it all, right? It's so often that we push God away in this instant and think that, no, he's too far away from me. He can't understand what I'm going through on this earth because I'm here living in this day to day and I'm having to deal with this and whatever my situation is. And yet this is such a critical verse, I think, for us when we think about what he is able to do for us and how he is able to, to support us. Any other thoughts about why this verse is particular, particularly important or any way that it's maybe helped you? You know, Elliot, this uh, makes me think about, you know, different times in our lives. We struggle, we um, rejoice. There's all kinds of emotions and, you know, things that we go through in our lives that no matter what we're going through, good or bad, God understands all of that. Mm -hmm. And like some of the um, examples in the last chapter, the end of the last chapter, it gives some examples um, of people that are, you know, oppressed or bowed down. We're all of those things at different times in our lives. And no matter where we are, we're high, we're low, we're struggling, we're searching, we feel like we're, you know, in an even plane, he's always there. And that's just so comforting to know that no matter what is going on in our lives, he's always there. He's the answer all the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I think about is just how how reassuring it is to feel that, you know, to the point that was made earlier, somebody else feels the same way that I have felt. And the psalmist here, I don't know who wrote this passage, but just to be able to read this and understand that this person was going through the same thing that, you know, I've gone through at various times in my life, and he has, you know, an answer or at least a thought that I want to, I want to also invoke is reassuring to me. You know, when you think about who we are as humans, we're, we're designed to empathize, right, with people. It's the reason why you can see someone miss the bus and you're like, God, oh, man, I know how much that stinks, right? You just, you just designed to empathize with people. It's built into us. And I think when we see other writers throughout the Bible, and the Psalms is maybe one of the best examples of that, who have very similar feelings and very similar thoughts, it's something that we, we empathize with um, as Christians today. Yeah, just kind of on that subject, I think we all, just like we're saying, have something in our nature that we desire to be understood. If you think about disagreements or frustrations that we, we've all had, probably the frustration stemmed from a pursuit, a, a pursuit of being understood and then not getting that. Like, we wanted to be understood, we were trying to be understood, and we just didn't get it from whoever it was. And I think we all feel that way. And so there's a huge comfort in knowing that God understands us deep down, which is an amazing thing because of our lack of understanding of him. And so what amazing grace is that, that um, if there was anybody that existed that should be frustrated that he wasn't understood, it would be God. And yet he meets us with grace and understands us and then like we read things like this. So that, that's just something I was thinking about. That's absolutely right. And that's a great point. I'm glad you said that, Matt, because how many times do we feel not understood? And, you know, to your point, you know, nobody else understands us. We think God can't understand us. But yet, you know, his answer is right here. But what's so ironic is doesn't he have every reason to be, you know, we don't know nearly as much. Um, about God as, as God knows about us even though we have his word right here it said that we have the mind of God but we don't know um, God like he like he knows us you know one thing this 
is understanding this author claiming you know this understanding of God is amazing but the verse before what what I think led led to this observation was just him looking up into the sky and beholding the stars and the magnitude and here you know we sit here and we know so much more than this writer when it comes to the stars the vastness of the universe so you know we need to take the time to look at the stars and say the God that created those he he understands me yeah. and it's just that's a powerful thing absolutely and it's, it's a good point you mentioned. We, we know so much more in our world today about probably every literal topic, you know, whether it's something that's microscopic uh, due to advancements that people didn't have, whether it's in astrology or biology, you name it. And yet it seems like our faith, maybe as a, a world, you know, I won't speak for us in the church, but as a world is, is further and further away, you know. And it's so ironic to me that we have passages like this and we can clearly then think about how much more we know about each of these specific subjects yet it's something that we we waste we squander and that's a great point any any other thoughts or comments around this this section before we keep moving yeah to that point about looking out at the stars humans are not good at conceptualizing infinity. We need restrictions. We need to put something in a box to be able to really chew on it. And so when, when we have a statement like his understanding is infinite, what that means is not only is he managing the physical cosmos and his angel, you know, all the stuff we don't see, physical and not, not only that, but he also has brain power to spare to look after me and my day-to-day -day struggles. And so when I feel overwhelmed, there again, do I, do I turn to you know, the prince of my country? Do I turn to the prince of the internet? Do I turn to you know, my friends, whoever it is? The fact that I can't really conceptualize infinity and, as was previously said, I can't see him physically, although I can see his works, it, it, even though I want to rely on him, I find myself not because I'm a human. And so statements like this really remind me, kind of ground me in that fact of he, he cares for me and he is powerful enough to back that up. Something we haven't talked about, which is a, is a great point, which is the, his capacity, right, in order to, to help us. You know, so often we think about helping each other, you know, in our walks. We have a finite capacity at every part of the day, usually, and whether it's helping, you know, your, your kids, your children, or your spouse or something, you've all reached that point where you're just, you're kind of out of it, you know, and <laughs> you don't have much left to give, but that's not the way God is here. And similar to your analogy with the stars and all that he all that he commands and directs. After all of that, we haven't even began to tap, you know, God deserves. He's, he's limitless. Uh, and I think that's a great point. To <coughs> uh, I was just reading a little excerpt by a man named John Gill, and he kind of goes into um, the word infinite here, and I just wanted to read it. It just says, his understanding is infinite. It reaches to all things, not to the stars of heaven only, as in Psalms 147, verse 4, but to the fowls of the air, to the beasts in the field, to the cattle upon a thousand hills, to all the surface of the earth or in the bowels of it, and to the fishes of the sea, it reaches to all men and to the thoughts of their hearts, to the words of their mouths and the actions of their lives. It reaches to all things past that have been, to everything present and to whatever is to come. It includes not only the knowledge of all things that are or certainly will be, but of all things possible or which he could bring into being if he would. It is concerned not only with the quality uh, and nature of things, it is 
or it perfectly understands, but with the quantity of them, even all things in creation and providence, which are without number, and past finding out by men, and so his understanding is without number and cannot be declared. I just thought that that like, really helped me understand the meaning infinite here and his power. Yeah. Wow, absolutely. I think so. That's a great, that's a great abstract. Thanks for sharing that. All right, we're going to go ahead and keep moving here. Um, verses 10 through 11 now start to highlight something that's an interesting interesting point that I think we'll probably end on here for, for time's sake. He says, uh, he does not delight in the strength of the horse. He does not take, the pleasure, take pleasure in the legs of a man. The psalmist starts to turn his attention now to what we appreciate, right, or what we take notice of. Very similar to the discussions that we've been having on what things uh, we, we put our trust in, what things we uh, generally look at. He then naturally, you know, observes some of the things of this earth that, you know, we may take, take notice of, you know, like a strong animal uh, or, you know, the legs of a man, what we're able to do. Um, which is very, very interesting. And I think so often, right, we worship creation, you know, if we're not careful, instead of the creator. And I think that's a, a point here that Psalmist is trying to get us to, to realize that the Lord favors those who fear him. What is, that's exactly what he leads with in the next verse. Those who wait for his loving kindness, in direct contrast to, to what he says there. Any, any thoughts uh, around that particular dichotomy? The comment was made earlier that we, you know we focus on what we can see. And I think this is another you know natural direct parallel to that. We so often focus on just what's in front of our own two eyes, but you know God is always focused on the heart, and that's exactly what the psalmist is is mentioning here, particularly verse uh, eleven, and that the Lord favors those those who fear Him. Okay, we'll keep going. Looks like we're going to have some time to finish um, finish up the rest of this. This uh, chapter, we see now the psalmist just piles on the praise. It says, praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. He has strengthened the bars of your gates. He has blessed your sons within you. He really starts talking about, in really poetic form, all the things that the Lord has done and the things that the Lord um, has given us. He says, he satisfies you with the finest wheat. He sends forth the, his command to the earth. He, uh, he gives snow like wool. He casts forth his ice, his fragments. Who can stand before his cold? Just really piling on the poetic prose here, you know, and all the things that the Lord does for us that he's able to do and uh, his power and his might. Any, any thoughts or comments on some of those, that, that symbolism that the psalmist is evoking here? Let's go ahead and move to the last couple of verses here before the bell. Uh, verse 19, he declares his words to Jacob, his statutes and his ordinances to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any nation, and as for his ordinances, they have not known them. Praise the Lord. What, what gift is he acknowledging here that hasn't been privy to other, other people? special people thereby yeah absolutely and what is that parallel to us today you know what we have is God's word and I think it's so interesting that in this psalm the last the last verse here is is what he that's what he details you know uh, really God's word the power of God's word thanks for 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 giving it to us the fact that we have this as a lamp to our feet and I just thought that that was such a, a great way to end um, end a psalm and probably one of the most pertinent applications that we can take on a midweek like today um, on Wednesday. Any other thoughts or comments on Psalms 146 or 7, 145, any, any of the psalms that we've talked about tonight? I'll psalm out. Okay. Well, we're going to go through Psalms 148 through 150 on um, Sunday, and Nick is going to be teaching that. 
and then we're going to have two song, uh, two classes on Song of Solomon that um, Brian Goff will, will teach. Thank you so much.